So welcome. Um, today, I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, exploring the Dharma of being human. And uh, it's pretty appropriate, I guess, that uh, at the same time I decided to do this, I got sick. So I've got a bit of a head cold. Um, you may um, see me blow my nose a few times during, the, during our gathering. Um, and yeah, I guess that's the Dharma of being human right there on display. So hope you all are, are well. So the Dharma of being human, to me, this is really what it's all about. I try to remind myself of this. It's hard though, because sometimes I'd just rather not be human, especially on nights like last night where I was up suffering most of the night. <laughs> but you know how it is. That's part of being human. So I want to start this uh, exploration by asking a question, which is, in one way, what is the simplest thing? What is the simplest thing? And one answer to that question is being human. Being human. That's who we are. This is, this is the name we use to describe ourselves. Human beings. Human beings being who we already are. And I love this phrase human being too, because it, it so directly ties in with the Buddhist wisdom tradition, traditions, explorations about freedom. And in particular, it really connects with a notion in Buddhism called the two truths or the doctrine of the two truths. And this uh, original teaching comes from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, and in a way, I want to just kind of explore the two truths of being human. In very simple terms, you know, the the, tr the first truth is the personal truth, and it's the truth of what it's like to be to be who you are, your unique personal self. And the personal truth includes, um, and, and here we could use the word human to describe that your particular humanness, your unique human self. And this includes everything um, that's unique about what it's like to be you, your unique set of circumstances and conditions, most of which you didn't pick or choose, right? We were born into a particular set of conditions that include all kinds of aspects and dimensions. Um, everything from our bodies and what our bodies look like, the kinds of genetics that we've inherited, the types of illnesses or proclivities we have toward wellness or illness. It includes the culture and the society that we've come up in. Um, it includes our economic class, what we're born into. It includes all the choices, the personal choices that we've made as well. It includes everything that's unique about our life, where we live, what we love, our preferences. But it's important, um, as Jack Kornfield mentions um, often, he says, you've got to remember your Buddha nature and your zip code. Um, so this is a pointer to the tr two truths. Um, and of course, here, the, the human side of the, of the two truths is our zip code. It's remembering the specifics, the particulars, you know, what is specific and particular about our life? Like when you zoom in to your life and you see all the specifics and the particulars, the uniqueness that you are, this includes your zip code, of course. Um, but it's not just that. And that's, I think it's good news that we're not just, there's not just one truth, which is that you're a human and you're unique and you're born and you'll die. Um, I mean, that is true too, but there's another reality or another dimension to reality that the Buddhist wisdom tradition invites us to explore. And this is really the basis of Buddhism itself. As the Buddha was uh, quoted uh, as saying, the cessation of grasping is deathlessness. 
the cessation of grasping is deathlessness. So the idea in early Buddhism or foundational Buddhism was that our main problem is that we're constantly grasping or holding on to reality. Um, and as soon as there's a letting go of that grasping, of that attempting to make it something other than it is, um, then there's freedom. There's this other dimension of our being, which is our being, our human being, um, that we also have access to our Buddha nature. Uh, a, a contemporary Thai forest teacher named Ajahn Amaro, he put the Buddha's words in a, in a slightly remixed them. He said, when grasping ceases, the ultimate truth appears. It's that simple. It's that simple. So in a moment of letting go, or as Sharon Salzberg says, in a moment of mindfulness, there is freedom. We do discover our Buddha nature um, when we let go. It's just like this. And being is um, universal. It's a universal truth for all beings, right? The idea of universal truth is interesting. Universal truth is true for everyone throughout all space and time or whatever possible future conceptions we might have of reality, what it is. <laughs> it's something which is always the case, never not true. And, and to me, it's, we got to be very rigorous about what we call ultimate truth, right? Like what actually qualifies? Um, because lots of harm in the world is actually done in the, in the name of ultimate truth. That's not really ultimate. Um, it's confusing ultimate with relative or ultimate and personal truths that can cause so much damage. But the ultimate truth is true for everyone all, all the time. Everyone here. And maybe some part of you might doubt that or deny that or think, no, that's not true for me. And that's cool. That's part of the personal truth, you know. It's true for you that you don't feel like you have access to the ultimate truth. That can be true on a personal level. But that doesn't make it true on the absolute level. As Ross Boletaire, a Zen teacher, put it, he said, the two truths do not represent different realities. Rather, they provide differing perspectives on reality. So what is the universal truth? What's the reality of the universal truth? Well, part of it is that we can't really describe it. You know, what is this dharma, this truth? Dharma literally means truth or can be translated as truth. What is this truth? Here, I want to read a little bit from uh, a Mahayana text called the Vimalakirti Sutra, where this... Um, enlightened practitioner who also, by the way, is not a monk. He's a merchant and his enlightenment is considered in the sutra to be right up there with the Buddhas. And in this story, uh, Vimalakirti is um, ill and it, presumably he's dying. And the Buddha um, invites all of his uh, students and acolytes all the arhats, the fully enlightened beings, all the bodhisattvas, all you know, all beings. He invites them to come and and ask them to go check up on Vimalakirti and see how he's doing. And one after another, each of his students, all these fully enlightened people, <laughs> they each say, "I can't." And then they recount a situation where they went to talk to Vimalakirti in the past, and he schooled them on Dharma. And so you can imagine these really enlightened people who are like, I'm scared shitless to go talk to this guy because they know he's going to just point out all the ways in which they're not quite getting it. <laughs> so in one of the exchanges that are recounted by one of the monks uh, with Vimalakirti, Vimalakirti shares this um, exposition on the nature of Dharma or universal truth. And here I'll share some with you. He says, expounding the Dharma should be done in accordance with the Dharma itself. The Dharma knows nothing of living beings because it's removed from the defilement of such concepts as living beings. The Dharma knows nothing of quote unquote I because it's removed from the defilement of such concepts as I. It knows nothing of, of a lifespan because it knows nothing of birth and death. 
It knows nothing of individuality because it's cut off from the consideration considerations of past and future lives. The Dharma is forever still and serene because it has wiped out all characteristics. The Dharma is without characteristics because it is without anything that can be perceived. The Dharma is without names or appellations because it's cut off from language. The Dharma is without expounding because it's removed from broad and minute contemplation by the mind. It's without forms or characteristics because it it is as though vacant and empty. The Dharma is not the subject of frivolous theories, because in the end, it's empty. The Dharma is without the concept of mine, because it's removed from all such concepts of personal possession. The Dharma is without distinctions, because it's apart from all types of consciousness. The Dharma has nothing it, it can compare it to, because there's no entity that can be set beside it. The Dharma is not affected by causes because it does not exist in a conditioned realm. Okay, he goes on and on and on here. I'm going to skip to the end. The Dharma is separate from beautiful and ugly. It knows no increase or diminution, knows no birth or extinction. The Dharma knows no destination. The Dharma transcends eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. The Dharma knows no high or low. It constantly abides without moving. The Dharma is separate from all meditational practices. Okay, so this is, to me, this is like pushing the ultimate truth as hard as you can push it. <laughs> it's like anything you say about this truth is not it, essentially. It's not that. It's not that. The truth of our being isn't limited to any of the characteristics that can describe that being. <laughs> Um, it's beingness itself, um, which is beyond name or form, because it includes name and form. It includes every bit of possible name and form. And and part of how I'd like to explore this, aside from just talking about it, um, is to actually practice it together here for a bit. So what I was hoping we could do is start by uh, doing a short practice, a Zen noting practice, where I'll invite you to identify with being itself. So as being, what do you notice? That's the basic question. And then the, the form of the practice is as being. You just say as being. And then whatever you notice, whatever it is that you're aware of as being. And then I'd like to stop after the practice and just check in and see what did you notice as being? We can fill in this truth before we move to the integration or the synthesis position of the two truths. So this truth of being um, that we just explored together, it's pretty nice. It's pretty great to let go of trying to be someone or having to be something or someone. You know, I'm sick today, so I notice moments where I just let go of being let go of being sick and there were still sensations and they were mostly unpleasant, but it wasn't like a problem. I was like, Oh, as being, there's no problem. That's one of the ways to know being. Um, I mean, there might be a problem arising in being or a feeling of something being up, uh, upsetting or uncomfortable, but, but the, with being, when we're really identified with being, we don't problematize experience. Um, we don't think, oh, this is, shouldn't be here. Um, that shouldn't be here is grasping. You know, that's the grasping that keeps us from uh, recognizing the universal truth. But the goal for me isn't just to abide in and hang out or get extincted in or by beingness. I mean, yes, that is a temporary experience. Like we can have an experience of losing ourselves a great enlightenment experience. But then the funny thing after every enlightenment is that the self continues to function. You know, we, we continue to um, be alive and still have all our same conditioning after before and after enlightenment or as Jack Cornfield, you know, in a, in a book he wrote, put it, you know, it's like after the ecstasy, you still have to do the laundry. Uh, there's still laundry. Um, and, and why, you know, why is that? Um, well, because there aren't two things. I remember what Ross Boletaire said, the two truths do not represent different realities. Rather, they provide differing perspectives on reality, different ways of seeing. 
we can see things from the personal viewpoint, right? We can see things from our own standpoint viewpoint. That's easy. We do that all the time. We can also see things from other people, other beings viewpoint to some degree. You know, we can, we can, um, to some degree put ourselves in other people's, uh, experience. That's part of the interesting thing of being a human, um, that capacity to alter perspective. And then we can actually let go of our human perspective or need to, I, to see things from any particular point of view. And, re and that reveals the ultimate point of view, which isn't based anywhere. It's not fixed. Um, but we still, we could talk about it as a point of view because the moment we try to express that, we have to use concepts to express it. Um, again, Ross uh, Boletier, I think, he, he puts this in a really interesting way. He says, the, in the essential, which is another word for being or um, the universal, the essential cannot be expressed in words. Rather, he says, it's expressed as words. This is a little different than what Vimala Kirti said. You know, we talked about Dharma being completely cut off from language. That's true if you're looking at it from the ultimate standpoint. As being what thoughts are there that could possibly describe who and what you are and the fullness of it. No, those thoughts can't get at it. Um, and letting go of the attempt to get at it reveals it more deeply. Um, and yet, perception continues to function. Okay, and what is perception? I saw this great definition recently from a Dzogchen teacher named Lama Lena. And she said, um, perception is when uh, sensations are interpreted. So in other words, if you have a sensation and then you add an interpretation, you get a perception. So uh, in the Buddhist you know, path, perception is one of what are considered these five aggregates that make up the experience of self. And those five aggregates, according to the basic Buddhism, continue to function before and after enlightenment in the same exact way. So we continue to interpret experience even after enlightenment. If enlightened, and if we talk about enlightenment just being that moment of recognizing that you're being, it's not a big deal. You know, it doesn't have to be. Um, but still, we got to talk about it. We, we try to express what that enlightenment is. And this is challenging. One way that Mah the Mahayana Buddhism expressed enlightenment is they, they described their interest in terms of what's called non-abiding nirvana. Neither rejecting samsara nor clinging to nirvana. So the idea of samsara, continuous cycling of experience without end, not rejecting that, right? That's the idea of the bodhisattva path. You don't reject samsara as a bodhisattva. You don't try to get out of it because you don't think there's somewhere else to go. So you're like, well, if I'm here and there's nowhere else to go, what do I do? <laughs> well, maybe I could help other people realize that <laughs> there's nowhere to go and discover the, the freedom of their own being. And maybe I could be helpful. The Mahayana critique of foundational Buddhism is that foundational Buddhism in some ways was still trying to escape or reject samsara, clinging to nirvana. Still some clinging, still some holding on, holding on to not suffering. So uh, this final perspective that I'd like to explore is the integrated perspective of the two truths. So what is it like for a being who's recognized that they're human has let go of an exclusive identification with their humanness and any characteristic that could describe them, meaning you know that that's not ultimately who you are, even if it is an important part of your provisional identity. And it needs to be honored and recognized and respected as such. Still, for, for, for one who goes beyond being and doing, we can discover this non-dual truth, we could call it. It's not either one. It's not limited by our humanness or it's not exclusively being. It's human being. It's being human. It's the Dharma of being human. What is it like? Another uh, name for being human that I learned in the Zen tradition from Diane Hamilton is freely functioning. A human being is some, uh, uh, a human being who's awake to the full dimension, to the full experience of being human. They're, they're freely functioning, largely. You know, they, they're able to move in and out of the personal truth 
like when they need to do something, something's called for, hey, can you give me your zip code? I need to update this document with your personal information. Okay, yeah, I can do that. I'm capable of knowing who's being referred to, and I can look up that information. I can function. Um, I still have preferences. I still don't want to be sick. Um, and yet I can let go and recognize too that all of this is in some ways fabricated and there's some dimension of experience which is available that's really reliable and I can let go of everything else and just rest as being and the freely functioning mind is the mind that can move in and out of those two truths so in this next practice, we're going to explore that um, and then wrapping up with that as freely functioning. What do you notice? So there's an invitation to become identified with that part of you, which is freely functioning, a freely functioning human being. <laughs>